Well, you're being recorded now, so this is going to go public. <laughs> Let's right. talk about the oxalate stream then. All right. So if, just to recap, the people that are going to come in and listen on this, we're talking about compromised cholesterol, and we're talking about the use of statins, or even to, furthermore, to people who have compromised blood sugar regulation, the use of metformin. Nothing wrong with their use, but they're not meant to be permanent features. The body never has had a deficiency of metformin or statins, but the body can have deficiencies of minerals and nutrients, especially fat soluble vitamins. What we're talking about here, Bacillus, is the impact of bile and the depletion that unwanted bacteria and fungus may have on bile. You see, what happens is when we have an overgrowth of microorganisms that create dysbiosis, and as uh, Bacillus so accurately translated, meaning bad living in Latin, gives us a really good understanding. Greek. Greek, sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Bacillus. Gives us a really good understanding as to what actually happens in the bile depletion. You see, these species feed off of bile to proliferate. They create spores through the consumption of our own bile. And as they create those spores, we have an imbalance of healthy living organisms or microorganisms in our body. And this, this imbalance creates an imba other, other imbalances, such as an imbalance to methane and hydrogen, which can create a changes in pH variability in the gut which compromises how we absorb minerals, one aspect. Another aspect is if we don't have enough bile, our ability to be able to emulsify fat and to absorb fat-soluble vitamins declines. And fat-soluble vitamins play a huge role in the absorption and utilization of minerals, particularly specific minerals such as boron, such as biotin, molybdenum, and manganese, amongst many others. When we start to have depletion happen of these minerals, what furthermore happens is that this regulation comes about, whether it be through blood sugar control or cholesterol, as in Vasilis's case. Now, an additional factor before we get into oxalates, I just want you to think about something. The body is so well in tune, and I feel as though our DNA, our biochemistry, our cellular uh, physics, if you look at the body in terms of physics, um, you will understand that on an energetic level, our body is far more conscious than what we are in trying to maintain equilibrium and balance. So that being said, if you were a conscious being and you were aware that there was a foreign microorganism that was compromising your health. And the reason why it was compromising, or, or compromising your health is because it was stealing some of your photons, some of your energy that you were releasing. What would be your immediate reaction to that? What do you think, Vasilis? Can you, okay. Can you reframe the question a bit simpler? Absolutely. You are a all-knowing being, okay? You're a sentient being, and you have all this energy that you feed to the universe, okay? You're part of a bigger whole. But some parts of the universe, you have shadow, some shadow beings. And those shadow beings are feeding off of a particular light that you are casting into your universe. What would be your first call of action to contain with those shadow beings, knowing that they are feeding off of your light. Eliminate them. And if you can't eliminate, how would you, okay? And how would you eliminate them? First, you need to diagnose them, understand who they are, what they do, how they are consuming and we, and that, the energy. And with, and with that, so we understand what the species are in your case, and we understand that they are surviving because of the light, the supreme being that you are, you are shading, that you are casting. Exactly, exactly, so what, exactly. What, what would you do to try and 
limit their opportunity of survival. Uh, take what I need to take to how stop about, them. How about giving them less of that light? Of course, if we cannot go to zero directly, we need to limit uh, the leakages. Makes sense. So the, the body is very clever. When we have compromise in the production or the release of bile, I feel strongly that it's the body's fail-safe mechanism to stop unwanted microorganisms that have grown out of hand from having an opportunity to proliferate. So we have lowered bile production or bile release from our bodies. So our okay. bodies actually lower. Produce less. Okay. So you are saying, in my case, to make it close to me, that it's not that the body is producing the same amount of bile that it would have been producing if those organisms were not there. You are saying that because the body is detecting that there is foreign body, right? Inside there is reducing the amount of bile that is producing to stop feeding them to become bigger. And then we have the chain reaction of the meta how we metabolize fat, how we're producing vitamins, how we're utilizing minerals, which are adding up to be increased cholesterol uh, in the body. One step back. Before we get into that, you're 100% right. However, it's about HDL to LDL ratio, right? Which in my case, I have a higher HDL and a very high HDL. I have a high HDL as well. No, no, Not no, so no, high, no. I have higher than optimal, my HDL. But I have LDL. a super high LDL. And those two are balancing themselves out from a ratio point of view. So I am not optimal. I'm a bit, little bit above optimal, but I'm not to the extreme that contemporary doctor will see and he will say, ah, you need statins. Now, last year, when we looked at your HDL to LDR ratio, what was your HDL doing? Low. Lower than now. Quite lower, actually. It was on the 50s, while now it was 70. So remember you asked the question about all the work that we did last year to contain with the bacteria. Was it, was it done with any effect or was it, were we, in, were we in, incapable or ineffective in our efforts? Remember you asked that question, I think it was in our last call. Yeah. We were effective and I'll tell you why. What is required to produce bile? It's there. So if your body is producing more or is redirecting the production or is increasing the production of proteins to redirect cholesterol towards increasing bile production, would we not have contended with a large load of the bacteria that you were contending with last year? Yeah. And if we also look into your bilirubin markers, total direct and indirect bilirubin, which is an indication of how the body breaks down red blood cells and also contributes towards bile production. We also noticed that direct bilirubin improved. Direct bilirubin wasn't very good when we started. And indirect bilirubin was high, meaning that there was biliary obstruction. Now that has improved, which means that your function of bile has dramatically improved. Now, going back to our story, the only time the supreme being of the universe would cost more light is if the shadow isn't strong enough to overshadow or to cast out that light. The light is bright enough. Now the shadow we dealt with were those microorganisms that we found last year, those two dysbiotic bacterial species. And I do feel that we were effective in containing with them. However, we hadn't looked deep enough. We didn't look into organic acids to figure out fungal, mold, as well as other forms of bacteria that weren't present in the initial stool analysis that came up later on in organic acids. So I would argue that the bacterial load was far higher last year than what we even recognized or realized. But we dealt with the, the most important aspects thereof, 
the highest priority of bacteria burden. And we, we dealt with it by peeling off the layer one at a time. Now, going back to this whole conundrum that we are, are containing with over here, we slowly started to improve biofunction, but there's still a great need to further improve its capacity to be able to help fat emulsification, improve fat soluble vitamin utilization, and thereby also help to restore the way in which our bodies utilize minerals, helping with oxidative stress, helping with blood sugar management amongst you know, testosterone production, amongst many other physiological outcomes. However, what we did discover is that you have candida as well as other yeast fungal overgrowths, which compromise how your body uses phenols, which is needed to be able to produce new neurotransmitters and also to contain with to be able to positively utilize antioxidants through sources such as berries and phenol rich fruits and foods. In addition to that, we found that you had high oxalates. Now oxalates are not just, uh, are not just consumed through food. They're also produced by our bodies as well as microorganisms, in particular candida, and mold produce a high amount of oxalates. What do oxalates do? They liberate copper and iron ions from protein carriers. What this does, copper and iron are extremely volatile metals that create huge amount of free radicals when exposed to oxidative stress, when they're unbound. So in essence, we get rusting in the body. Now, in addition to that, we need copper and vitamin C to produce an enzyme. An enzyme that stops your brain from being in a position of toxicity. So it prevents the brain from reaching a point of dopamine toxicity because these two precursors, copper and vitamin C, produce dopamine beta hydroxylase. So think of it this way. It's like having a dam without a wall and it continues to rain. And eventually the water continues to flow over the, over the dam perimeter until the point where the volume of water is so insurmountable that the dam wall breaks. And we have neurochemical imbalances arise from this. This is a good way to see dopamine beta hydroxylase. This is also a good understanding of how important it is that our body uses copper as well as iron, for oxygen transportation, for the purpose of improving brain chemistry that furthermore has an impact on cholesterol and how our bodies use cholesterol. How that all happens, excitation and inhibition play a huge role to free radical production. When our bodies are in a state of excessive free radical production, we transport cholesterol for the purpose of healing oxidative microabrasions that occur from high free radical exposure. However, when our brains are in a nice harmonious state, we use that same cholesterol to produce protective covering to our nerve endings called myelin to improve how our nervous system functions. So this is why it's so important to get neurochemistry right. And it's also very important to get neurochemistry right by not just looking at the neurotransmitters, but looking also at the raw material that our body utilizes in order to create balance. So oxalates bind to calcium and are released from the body so long as the calcium is um, absorbed or utilized in the gut and, and utilized properly in directive of enough vitamin D and vitamin K. Without sufficient quantities of these two fat-soluble vitamins and a high intake of calcium, we actually create calcium oxalate crystals which deposit in our bones, in our brains, in our thyroid, one of the biggest contributing factors to poor thyroid function is high oxalates bound to calcium that has been in, misdirected into its utility because of poor vitamin D, as well as the pancreas, another contributing factor toward uh, onset of diabetes. So we need to make sure to use the calcium effectively in ridding the body of oxalates. But in addition to that, Oxalates also have a huge role, not only to create devastation to copper and iron, like I mentioned, but they have a high affinity 
to bind to mercury. So much so that it's 10 million, that's right, 10 million times greater than its binding affinity to calcium. So all your efforts to try and get rid of heavy metals, whether it be through a mild detoxification protocol like chlorella to advanced chelation therapy like EDTA might all be for naught if you're not contending and considering with a high oxalate load and how to get rid of it effectively. That's why you have in the protocol at the end the cholina, cholina that you described. Uh, exactly. So just for me to recap, without having your uh, deep uh, data understanding here. So oxalates, bottom line, we will treat it from low oxalate food. So a lot of things that seem to be very healthy in what I'm eating, like blueberries, sweet potatoes, etc., needs to be eliminated for a period of time, as well as we... So first, firstly, when it comes to low, it's... A low oxalate diet does not. But you also eat... put as a CRD diet as well, circadian rhythm diet as well. Yeah. So smaller portions, more frequently, five lunches, five, five meals a day. What we don't want to do in your state where we see dopamine toxicity being present due to compromised to copper metabolism that is likely to have been sourced due to oxalates, uh, um, oxalates compromising activity to copper. What we don't want to do is put you on fasting or high fat, particularly not high fat. High fat diets in people with high oxalates is very counterintuitive and contradictory. And the reason for that is high fat diets render calcium incapable of actually helping the body to remove oxalates. Okay. So this is what often is seen, you know, in people following paleolithic type of eating protocols with a high fat emphasis is that they're eating foods that have a high density of oxalates, but they're also eating a macronutrient ratio that's rendering minerals that are meant to contain with those oxalates incapable of doing so. So the outcome to this whole scenario is that you're fueling oxalate intake, but also inhibiting oxalate removal, detoxification. So what we don't want to do is add to that problem. So we're actually not going on even on a CRD. We're going to go on a higher uh, carbohydrate plan, not high carbohydrate, but higher carbohydrate plan, where you'll be eating 45% of carbohydrates. You'll be eating 35% of protein. And then you'll be having the last 20% of fat. Fat coming through low amounts of animal saturated fats and high amounts of plant oils. Plant oils, olive oil, and fatty fish. Mediterranean type of protein intake. Yeah. What about, so, okay, so I understand. The, the, the core thing for me that was harder to get and very limiting is that on the carb side, although it's a higher carb diet, mm -hmm. still most of the oxalates I'm currently getting is from carbs. Correct. So we would need to do modification on what type of carbs and fruits and stuff I'm eating, which... And to that further, to that, to that point as well, so let's remember, it's a low, not a no. It's a low, not a no. So in that list of oxalate foods I sent you, the items with asterisks uh, indicated next to them, those are the items that we're going to refrain from intaking to our diet. Oxalates aren't all bad. Oxalates also play a, a beneficial role in ensuring that we do not have excessive calcium deposits occur throughout our body as well. Okay, so they're not all bad. It's just a question of quantity. And in your case, we want to reduce the quantity. So it's not a it's not a no oxalate diet. It's a low oxalate diet. Okay. Uh, in addition to you the, will send me you will send me a suggestion of a diet, right? Of so at least to have some ideas. Yeah. Because when I looked at the foods, 
I found it, uh, it, it you need to be very specific. And, and my education is not at that level yet to understand you know, oxalate. So it's a new field of learning. Well, no problem. Absolutely. We'll give you a dietary example to show you what it looks like, but also give you a whole list of foods that are permitted and the foods that aren't permitted as well. Um, the other thing for you would be a low to moderate phenol intake. Okay. What about green tea then? Green tea, it has polyphenols, right? Yeah. Can I, can I drink green tea? Not for not high quantities. So a cup a day, two cups a day at max, but more than that would be counterproductive. Not because there's anything wrong with uh, polyphenols. There's actually a lot of good. Is this the, okay? Is this quality? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. That's fine. Okay. Um, we don't need to take phenols out entirely. We just need to reduce the load your body is having to deal with because of a particular marker that's been elevated that shows compromise as to how the body contends with phenols. So that's why we're not going to do, no, none of this is no. So we're not going to do no oxalates, no phenols. It's a low oxalates, low phenols. Okay. And obviously low histamine. Okay. Not no, again, low. Right. And these are the dietary measures we will implement in order to contain with what's going on there. And then in addition to that, we will utilize specific minerals as well as specific pharmaceutical, nutraceutical um, combinations of remedy to help your body to contain with the fungal overload, but also to help your body to rid itself of these oxalates, the excessive quantity of these oxalates. And that's too complicated to put over here on uh, this call because <laughs> that's very elaborate. And that's also my secret recipe, which if you do need it, please come reach out to us. I'm happy to do it, but it is going to require an investment to figure out whether or not it's your recipe because it's Facilis's recipe and it might not be yours. So I don't want to give that information to people and lead them astray. Um, was that helpful? No, this was extremely highly educational. So a completely different perspective on uh, two core things that I care about, high cholesterol and low cortisol. So, and how the interaction between two comes from two very different uh, viewpoints than definitely the conventional one. But I would say even on our case that we were seeing it in, I mean, we have gone to deep to depths and we have even gone now to bigger depths to understand the actual impact on uh, the biochemical factors that is triggering those things. Most certainly. So, we most certainly are going to be continually, we are sorry, so we are certainly going to continue to peel the layers of your onion. And I feel like over the year that we've worked together, we've peeled a lot of layers. Um, and it sometimes can be frustrating because you've got to go a few steps back to go quite a few steps forward at times. And I think we've both felt that in our the relationship that we've gained over Absolutely. the year. Of course. But progress nonetheless is definitely has has definitely occurred. And we can see this just by looking at the ratio between your high density to low density lipoproteins as well as your bilirubin ratios. You know, there's a huge change that's happened there. That is, you know, that's one of the biggest shifts to occur towards cardiovascular health and the prevention of atherosclerosis as well. So I'm really happy with that. This also, I just want to like, for people that are watching, this doesn't mean that we, that I am promoting or discouraging the promoting, promoted use of statins or fibrates. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that these pharmaceutical aids are meant to be utilized as medicine. Medicine traditionally is never meant to be a staple in somebody's life. Not meant to use it for the rest of your life. It's meant to be used to create a shift, a directional change as to how the body is functioning. So Facilis and I are utilizing a fibrate along our efforts to improve on how the body utilizes minerals, absorbs fatty acids, and subsequently also is able to remove 
unwanted microorganisms that compromise amino acid metabolism, which has an impact on the brain, furthermore impacting the aforementioned but we're utilizing pharmaceuticals to support that as well. You don't want to leave a person completely exposed whilst you're trying to create reformation. Give them the support, but deal with the root cause whilst you're giving them the support. Don't just give the Band-Aid, not looking at the wound. You've got to check up on the wound and make sure it heals so that eventually you can take that Band-Aid off. And that's what we're doing. Absolutely. Lissalis, thank you so much for sharing your story with everybody. And I know it's a vulnerable space to be in. And I really appreciate you allowing us just to share this knowledge with people out there. I think a lot of people are struggling with this and they're probably at their wit's end, you know, utilizing a whole host or batch of drugs that are just making them feel a lot worse. Um, you know, I just wanted to further point out the use of statins depletes pyridoxine. Pyridoxine is otherwise known as vitamin B6. When you use statins concurrently for a long period of time, without considering the impact it has on vitamin B6, pyral disorder can set in. Pyral disorder is the way in which our bodies, or, in a, or the dysfunctional way in which our bodies metabolize heme, which is the component of our red blood cells that carry oxygen. So over time, by utilizing an aid, you might be causing other problems toward cardiovascular health. And that may be through compromised red blood cell health. So be smart about the use of statins and understand the depletion they cause and make sure to replenish your body in knowing the depletion that these drugs can cause, preventing the outcome of unwanted side effects. For me, Justin McGuire, thank you again, Vasilis. Really appreciate you. Thank you Stay optimized. Stay optimized, guys. <laughs>